I'm Dylan Hubbard here at Hubbard's Marina with another live stream show. It is Sunday night, July 5th, Sunday night, July 5th, and we are getting started with another live stream show. Going to get started here on Facebook and uh, need a few minutes to get rolling and uh, we're going to get into this show. We got a special show for you tonight. We've got a special guest uh, that is Mr. Benny Ortiz, the slow pitch jigging master, uh, the slow pitch Jedi. There's so many names for you, Benny. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of them floating around out there. But uh, long story short, guys, tonight is a special show. We've got a special guest in studio with us tonight. Well, kind of in studio, virtually in studio, uh, talking slow pitch jig fishing. So a unique form of fishing we're talking about tonight. Uh, we still are doing our free trip giveaways. You still have a chance to win a free five-hour half day for two guests, a 10-hour all day for two guests, and we're giving away that free 39-hour fishing trip for one guest. So make sure to sit back, relax, grab your drink, and get ready for that live stream fishing show here at Hubbard's Marina. We have a great one lined up for you tonight. Some cool video or uh, cool photos to show you and stuff like that. Definitely and a lot of good stuff free. going on tonight. And then with our guest, we're going to be talking about that slow pitch jig fishing quite a bit. So excited about tonight's show myself. I think I'm going to learn a lot with you guys about this whole slow pitch jig fishing. If you haven't heard about slow pitch jigging, by the end of tonight's show, hopefully you'll be somewhat of an expert, at least as much as you can pick up from an hour-long show. Our Sunday night live stream show happens every Sunday night at 8.30 p.m. And keep in mind, guys, don't forget to comment where you're watching from. Don't forget to like our Facebook page, Hubbard's Marina. <coughs> Subscribe to us on YouTube. Just simply search Hubbard's Marina. I know, like I said last week, about 70% of you guys watching are not subscribed on YouTube. So make sure to hit that subscribe button for us on YouTube. Don't forget to comment where you're watching from and share this video with friends. Share it on your favorite fishing group, on your favorite fishing forum. Make sure to tell your friends uh, to come join us tonight. We got a great show lined up for you guys. We're going to rip through the photo section in the beginning of the show, guys, because we want to spend a lot of time on these uh, questions tonight. The live questions, we want to spend extra time on those. So make sure to uh, hold on to your seats and have those questions ready. You can text your questions into that phone number in the upper right-hand corner of the screen. You see it there, 727-393-1947. You can text your questions into the show, and we'll answer your questions live on video tonight. Uh, Benny will be doing most of the answering, not so much me, but <laughs> uh, definitely excited to get into it tonight. So we are just about ready to start don't forget again if you're watching on youtube give the video a thumbs up don't forget to subscribe to our channel if you're watching on facebook give the video a like comment where you're watching from and don't forget to share this video on your timeline start a watch party appreciate the stars sarah thanks for sending those stars to us this this afternoon or night what what day is it i'm, I'm losing track it's already early in the show uh, it is Sunday night, July 5th, 8.31 p.m. Thanks for watching. If you're watching live, bear with us. We're going to start the video shortly. If you're not watching live, you can skip forward to where you see the video start. Benny, you got your drink. You ready, buddy? We are all set. Uh-oh. He's armed and dangerous. I'm ready to rock and roll. I think it is that time. So we're going to get the video started up here, guys. Thanks for tuning in tonight. Again, Captain Dylan Hubbard here at Hubbard's Marina. And tonight, we've got our special guest, Benny Ortiz. Thanks for joining us, bud. Pleasure to be here, Dylan. Thank so, you. for those of you who don't know who Benny is, uh, he is credited, I think, uh, in my opinion at least, for kind of making 
slow pitch jig fishing famous, uh, if you will, in uh, the whole region, if not the nation. I mean, it kind of started where, I mean, Japan, Australia, I guess. Yeah, it, it first started in Japan. Uh, it started probably 15 years ago or so. A guy named Norohito Sato was the guy who, who invented it. Uh, and it was just designed for, you know, high pressure fisheries. And it was a different type of fishing. You know, and uh, honestly, it, it went into the, the marketing cycle of, of fishing products in Japan, you know, just like anything else, where you may have seen butterfly jigging that had a shelf life. Um, this kind of uh, also crept into that, but it seems to be a, a bit more effective for the types of fish that we fish for primarily uh, here in the States. Yeah, I mean, like fish, high pressure fisheries. So when you say that, the grouper, the snapper, the the fish that you wouldn't normally, because I mean, myself growing up, we did a lot of uh, vertical jigging. I mean, I grew up with diamond jigs. That was when you think of jig fishing, you thought of diamond jigs, and that's at least me growing up. That's that's how I fished. It was either dead bait, live bait, and occasionally, if I was fishing for amberjack, I'd use a diamond jig. Uh, but right. apart from that, we didn't really do much jig fishing, and now. Nowadays, with the slow pitch jig fishing becoming more and more popular, now people are catching a variety of species on jigs, including things like snapper, mutton snapper, things that wouldn't bite. I mean, mutton snapper, for goodness sakes, you're using some fisheries use 12, 15 foot, 60 pound fluorocarbon leaders, 40 pound fluorocarbon leaders to try to get these mutton snapper to bite because they're so leader shy and you guys are catching them on jigs. Yeah, pretty routinely, too. So it kind of uh, blows a hole in in the the tradition of of what a lot of people had previously thought. Um, And it's not only just the types of fish that you catch. I think now I'm up to about 78 different species of fish that I've caught on jigs. Wow. uh, Which is a lot. But but the types of fish that you catch and where you catch them is also sometimes a surprise. Yeah, as far as, like, the depth? What do you mean? Yeah, like, so, for instance, um, you know, a lot of people think that if you want to catch blackfin tuna, you've got to troll for them, right? I can't tell you how many blackfin tuna I've caught on the bottom in between four and 600 feet of water, you know, during the middle of the day. They'll just, you'll get hooked up, it'll blast off, start peeling drag, not sure what you got, and all of a sudden, blackfin tuna starts coming up. Um, I've caught, in in Jupiter, I I caught a a thump on the bottom, about 225 feet of water, um, line shoots straight out, and I'm thinking, great, it's a cobia, a bill comes out of the water, and it was a sailfish. So, you know, these well, fish are... let in- me stop you. You caught a sailfish on a slow pitch jig? Yeah. Landed it, too. Yeah, yeah there's, there's only... What's that? You said routinely? No, 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 no. Oh. No, not routinely. Not, not, not sailfish. Um, billfish are a pretty rare one, but the, the hardest thing with them is, is obviously landing them on, yeah. on the tackle because you've got so much going on there. But I had a pretty cooperative one, and he came to the boat. <laughs> that's crazy man so where do you normally fish out of when you talk about slow pitch jigging i know you're not necessarily in our direct area in central west florida right so i primarily fish off of southeast florida so anywhere from uh i guess canaveral would be pretty much the farthest north that i regularly fish um all the way down to you know key west pulley ridge um you know i do i've fished in, on on your trips you know many times uh, particularly like the, uh, the extreme boat going out there to the deeper water. Um, but you know, down, you know, Tortugas quite a bit, Bully Ridge is kind of like my, my happy place. I gotcha. I yeah. gotcha. So you're most of the time Southeast Florida and into the Keys essentially. Yeah. Yeah. Mostly. Now that brings up a good question about jig fishing. A lot of people ask like, well, I want to go jig fishing on a 10 hour trip where on a 10 hour trip, we're maybe fishing 60 to a hundred foot of water. And to me, jig fishing, I don't really start thinking about using a jig for fishing until I'm 120, 150, even 200 foot of water. Uh, what would you say would be the shallowest that you would utilize a jig? Sure. So it's really region specific. So what I've found, um, in South Florida, it usually works better, 150 feet-ish or higher, you know. Um, on your side, I've had really good success down as far as 60 feet of water on jigs, you know. Um, and really, it's just a matter of scaling down your tackle. Like, for instance, I mean, this this little guy here, this is a 20, 29-gram jig. So you can fish this, this little tiny tackle in really shallow water and be very effective or You can go to really deep water, you know, fishing something like this, which is a 450 gram jig, and really go the entire water column. But generally speaking, it's deeper is better. 
Okay, deeper is better. So one question to uh, kind of back up a little bit is what makes a slow pitch jig? This is a question I get a little bit, and I think I have an idea, but what makes a slow pitch jig different from a normal like butterfly jig or, or knife jig or diamond jig? Sure. So most of the slow pitch jigs are center weighted. So they're going to fall pretty evenly. Um, they're going to lay flat pretty evenly in the water once tension is off the line. Um, and they'll do different actions in the water depending on how they're shaped. So some will have, you know, a really big backsliding action. Some will fall like a leap like this. Some will wobble on the way down. Um, you know, in the different shapes of jigs, I have a bunch of them here that we can go through as we go through the night. Um, just kind of give you an idea of the different types and shapes that are considered slow pitch jigs. Some are long and skinny, some are short and fat. So I apologize to anybody who's watching who I answered incorrectly because I thought a slow pitch jig was asymmetrical. I thought that's what made a slow pitch. They, they are asymmetrical, but it's the weighting that, that's really key. So when you say asymmetrical, you mean that there's usually one flat side of the jig and one side that's not flat. So it's, you know, one side it has some type of shape. Now that shape can be flat like this or it can be concave like this one. Or it can be like this one where it's more of a, a triangle shape. You can kind yeah. of see how that triangle shape. But they are asymmetrical jigs, but most of them are center weighted. That's, I think, my, the, the main distinction. Okay, so it can be asymmetrical, but not necessarily a slow pitch. Uh, yeah, usually, um, not to get too far into the weeds in that, you know, um, yes, any jig can be used as a slow pitch jig. Slow pitch jigs are generally just used for the fall. Not necessarily the ski retreat. Because there's some jigs on the market. I have some in my shop that claim to have a flutter action, but they're very symmetrical. So I've always questioned that, like, well, is that truly a slow pitch? But if they're making some claims about this flutter action or that back and forth action, that's going to be more of a slow pitch jig. Right. Anything that's going to have that, that kind of falling, not necessarily erratic, but predictable falling action from it can be used as a slow pitch jig. So I don't, you shouldn't get too bogged down in the term slow pitch jig. Any jig can really be used just depending on how it's fished. Okay. So that just blew my mind. So even a diamond jig could be a slow pitch jig. Every time that someone asks what they should start with, the first thing I tell them to do is get a hammered diamond jig. Absolutely. A hammered, a hammered diamond jig. Why? Because it is the Toyota Camry of jigs. It's been around forever. It's reliable. You learn the action of it. You know what you're getting. It's not that expensive, and it catches fish. Once you get once you get used to that, and you get used to your action, you get used to your technique. Then go into the forty dollars Japanese stuff. Wow. All right. So that is interesting because I thought you had to start with one of those uh, thirty forty dollars jigs. I didn't realize you could slow pitch jig with a diamond jig. Yeah, you certainly can. Um, the, the one thing that you shouldn't lose sight of is that you know. These fish, for most of their life, everything that they've eaten has been a fish, right? Everything. And this one time, it's not. So as long as it, it's, it's in their face, it appears to be something wounded and easy meal, what I found is that most fish will react to it. And that's what it really is. It's that reaction strike that, you, that it, it triggers from the fish. Huh. All right. So a reactionary strike. So... We already got like super far down this road and I'm, I'm <laughs> super interested. I feel like I forgot about everybody watching already because now I'm just asking questions for myself. Mm -hmm. uh, so let's back up a little bit. We got to first show some photos real quick. I know everybody was interested to see what we've been catching out there. So we're going to quickly show some of these offshore fishing photos. But as you can tell, Benny is a wealth of information, and we're going to try to extract as much of that tonight as possible. So real quickly, we're going to rip through these photos uh, and show you guys what we've been catching. We had a really good 10-hour all-day trip today. I'm pulling up this photo here. Uh, this one is Reef from Tampa on our 10-hour all-day. Caught this nice gag grouper today with Captain Bobby. 
Uh, beautiful fish. The red snapper bite has been really good. The flying hub two on the extreme trips been seeing big red snapper, fat red grouper mixed in with them. Some nice gag grouper action for sure. And uh, definitely a great time to be out in the water right now. We've been seeing some really really good fish this is christopher uh valerie and his sister crystal uh crystal went out fishing with her brother uh and uh, caught a really nice red grouper which we're gonna see here shortly uh some more gags and this is crystal's first ever grouper she wanted to go out there and try uh some grouper fishing she's uh, they've been out together on our 39 hour trip uh, for a few years in a row. Never had a chance to catch a grouper herself. She went out and got a combo, went out and learned a lot, tried to really get uh, dialed in on the grouper fishing. First drop down on a 12 hour extreme, caught like a 24 pound fat red grouper. Uh, needless to say, she is very, very excited about that beautiful fish. We've got Sophia here showing off her beautiful mahi mahi she actually caught this on a five hour half day we're seeing those mahi as shallow as 40 foot of water right now so really cool to see the mahi sean porch key big red grouper or red snapper sorry we got those big trigger fish uh unfortunately brian had to throw this trigger fish back those gray trigger fish are closed uh, but we've got plenty of these big mangroves red snapper gag grouper that beautiful scamp grouper uh, look at Richie holding that monster red snapper, some 20, 21, 22 pound red snapper uh, lately, some big red grouper, some beautiful scamp. We're starting to see those kingfish again. The 44 hour trip definitely uh, was a little slower than we would have liked, but they had a lot of trolling time to bring in some really nice kingfish. The uh, current was really bad. They had to contend with and uh, the current was so rough it really made fishing a little bit tougher than we would have liked but they caught some nice fish regardless uh, as you can see here the fishing has been hot and uh, we're excited about it so hopefully you guys enjoyed those photos got a chance to rip through them at least and uh, real quick we're going to give away a five hour half day for two guests uh, keep you guys on your toes we're going to do a 10 hour all day for two and that 39 hour trip later i'm trying to rush through all this because we got to get back to these questions so real quick a five hour half day for two guests let's see who that lucky winner is of the five hour half day for two guests so five hour half day for two goes to drum roll please dale opie let's get the show on the road well dale the show is on the road and uh you are the lucky winner of a five hour half day for two don't forget guys in order to claim those free trips you have to text that phone number in the upper right hand corner of the screen uh, within about five minutes to prove that you're watching the show live so make sure uh, Dale as the lucky winner you text that phone number in the upper right hand corner and that's how you claim that free trip uh, and prove that you were watching the show live all right well we're back to you Benny all right back on the hot seat let's see we've got oh a ton of questions in from guests I was I'm kind of disappointed here, people. I had more questions for myself, but <laughs> we'll get back to my questions later, I guess. All right. So the first question um, I asked you a little bit earlier, uh, Benny, about mm -hmm. the, uh, the the short strokes versus the long strokes. I, I forget how the question was even worded. As I said, right. I, I didn't remember it myself or understand it. Sure. So I think the question, if I recall correctly, it was about uh, Temple Reef came out with a rod last late last year called the Innovate. Uh, the Innovate was my design, uh, and it was really the first time that a rod was specifically designed for our fishery, you know, larger headboat style fishery, um, something that's going to have excellent action, but also have power on it as well. So, um, you know, just to back up one step, part of the reason why I'm answering this question is because there's two types of rods, right? There's the traditional slow pitch rod, which is usually between like six foot three to six foot 10, depending on the brand. Um, then there, so this, the ones that are like six foot eight to six foot 10 are kind of your intermediary rods between like the pure slow pitch and the kind of what they call long fall rods. 
And then there's rods that are about eight feet long, which are long fall rods. So those are just more very lift and fall. You're getting the maximum fall of that jig in the water column. Um, the, you can make them a little bit less technical than the smaller, the shorter rods, uh, because it is mostly a lift and fall. What the, what the question was asking, though, is with that longer rod, can you still do those short technical movements? The answer is yes, with that particular rod. Um, that's something that was really important to me when I was designing it. Um, I really, really, really wanted to get the action dialed on it. And I feel like I got it right on both the medium heavy and the heavy action. So you can still use it for those short technical movements, but it allows that long fall action where you're getting a really big sweep of that jig in the water. Okay. So back it up to our, uh, our, my level of yeah. jig fishing, uh, mastery. So long fall, you mean lifting that rod tip all the way to the sky and dropping it all the way back down and letting that jig fall that whole distance. That's what you mean by long fall. Essentially. Yes. So if you, if I was going to do a profile, right, if I'm, if I'm here and you imagine that this is a clock, right? Yeah. 12 o'clock, six o'clock, let's call that nine o'clock right mm -hmm. i don't know i can't tell what, what, which way it's looking it's nine <laughs> o'clock most slow pitch action is going to happen between like seven o'clock and ten o'clock okay yeah. so it's going to be in this area here all right long fall will go from seven o'clock all the way up to twelve o'clock okay so it's a much longer action so you're putting that rod up and when it flicks you're flicking all the way up here and that jig has a lot more hang time in the water that hang time and that erratic fall is when you get the strikes. 90% of the strikes that you get on these jigs are always almost always on the fall. So that's true of the old common style of jigging that we're all used to, vertical jigging with the diamond jig, uh, the standard way. It's always on the fall. So that's the same, right. same is true of slow pitch jigging. Yes, correct. All right. So essentially the shorter action movements are more erratic you were saying and i've noticed that myself when i see people jigging you, you've got the one guy going like this and cranking fast and you got the other guy who's working the rod much slower so that's uh, just two different ways to work the same lure or do you have to have two different jigs those are two different styles essentially so the the erratic shorter rods the very shorter rods i'm talking the ones that are like you know five seven five eight five five short short rods those are the speed jig rods where you're ripping that thing through the water column, right? The shorter slow pitch rods are still longer than that, but they're made of a very elastic carbon. So they have a very high carbon content, very elastic. And what they do is they're really just a one trick pony. They're just designed to impart an action on the jig. And they're very specialized with their weights and what jigs they will work with in terms of, of weight range. Um, so you can, you know, you can overload a jig with a heavier jig to get a slower presentation. You can underload a rod that's, you know, rated for higher jigs. You get a peppier presentation. Everything about it and with the time on the water that you spend, you can get that dialed into what the fish really want. Um, you know, sometimes it'll be as much as, you know, fish just want a little bump off the bottom. They don't want big long falls. That just comes with time in the water. I feel like we need more than an hour to cover this. <laughs> I mean, probably. <laughs> <laughs> so when you normally do seminars on slow pitch jig fishing, you're most of the time you're already talking to kind of intermediate jig fishermen, huh? Yeah, or, or even if they're not intermediate jig fishermen, um, the way it's set up usually when, I, when I'll do a seminar, which is just kind of me downloading on people, is I, I'll bring you through all the tackles. So I'll go through the where it started, I'll go through the rod, the reel, the line, the leader, the terminal connections, the jigs, the techniques, all those things to give you the fundamentals of really the pure slow pitch way to do it. Once you master that or you're competent in that, then kind of branch out into the other stuff that's that's available. I got you. So the techniques is kind of like class 102, whereas just the tools of the trade are kind of 101, huh? Right, exactly. Exactly right. So when you go into, you know, specialized questions about stuff, you skip over a lot of the other pretty necessary details in the beginning. I got gotcha, you. I got gotcha. you. So let's talk a little bit about some of those smaller necessities. Uh, mm -hmm. Try to rip through class 101 as quick as you can. All right. Okay. So class one, I guess. So let's just start with a rod, rod and reel combo. All right. So this is a Temple Reef Levitate. This is... Um, you know, so you can see it's a very long, skinny butt section. 
This is an accurate Valiant 300. Um, I would feel perfectly comfortable bringing this almost everywhere that you guys fish. Even though it is a very small reel, it's loaded with 30 pound uh, braid. It's got a 50 pound leader on it. That's what I primarily fish. Um, you can see my hook set up here, the terminal connection, which is a uh, ball bearing swivel to these two hooks. Okay, split ring in the middle there. I feel like um, you forgot a jig. <laughs> well, I use them. I leave them like this whenever I don't. Whenever I'm not fishing, I don't. I don't uh, you know, I don't have jigs attached. These blanks are so sensitive. If you have jigs banging around on them, uh, it's gonna snap it. It's just. It's just gonna. It's gonna damage the blank. It's gonna break it. Uh, it's one of the things here in the states that's a very difficult thing to get around because people are so used to these meat sticks. You know, they're fishing on on a trip like yours on a big head boat. They're fishing an eight foot rod that's you know fifty to eighty pound rated. The thing's got a blank this big around. Mm -hmm. You know, you could bash it against a tree and it'll be fine. <laughs> this thing has a two millimeter tip on it. You know, you can't even really you know, see it's tiny. Yeah. <laughs> I can't get it, get it in here. Um, but it's a totally different concept. So you've got to be pretty ginger with these things. That being said, when used properly, these things are a weapon. You know, these things can put a lot of heat on them so long as you're not high sticking the rod. Um, you know, like I said, it's a tool to, to impart it action on the jig, not to fight the fish. Once you hook up, everything's off of the reel. Okay, um, so we're condensing that that big long series. So sensitivity, right? It's broken down so you have, you know, this is going to be under your forearm when you're jigging. This is this is how you're going to be holding it. You're using your forearm kind of as a as a fulcrum point of that lever to lift the the rod. The it'll load up with your jig in the water, and that recoil of the rod will flick it out in the in the water column. The better quality rods are going to be really slow action rods. Okay, they're going to be very slow, even unloads. You don't want you don't want a rod that's going to spring back really quickly because what's going to happen is you're going to lose your jig, and you've probably seen you know these jigs have tail hooks on them. Mm -hmm. When you that rod springs the jig back, those tail hooks flip and they catch your leader a lot of times, so you get fouled up on them. Mm -hmm. um, you know, one of the questions you had asked before is uh, before we even started talking was was these micro guides on them. Why are these guides so small? It's all about sensitivity. Right, and this slow pitch jigging is really a listening game. You're taking in all this feedback by having that that line really close to the blank. You're getting the maximum feedback that you can get from it. So you can basically feel a fish sniffing your jig down there. Um, you know, it's it's that sensitive. Uh, you know, a lot of people talk about the line that you use. You know, why do you use 30 pound line? Yeah, I'm fishing for a grouper. I can't tell you how many times people have tried to laugh me off the boat before um you know before i get out there and then i'll win the fish pool and people are like, well, where'd you get that thing you know <laughs> um it just tends to happen and really you know, it comes down to um something that's that was said to me a long time ago and that was never lose a fish for preventable error and that is my really my mantra for for fishing and that even requires testing your gear right just because you have something that says it's 30 pound line Let's see what it breaks at, right, in a straight pull. How many times have you had your braid break, you know, other than like a bad batch or maybe there's a crack in the guide or something, but in a straight pull, very, very rarely do these things break. That 30-pound braid in a straight pull breaks at 52 pounds. The reel only puts out 28 pounds of drag at in its best day, so it ain't breaking in a straight pull. Braid breaks from abrasion, right? And if your braid is already in whatever is in the bottom, you've already lost the fight anyway, so it doesn't really matter. Right. Yeah, and that um, brings a up a great point that a lot of times I see people overpowering. They're like, "Oh yeah, yeah I've got a 125 pound braid because it's only got the diameter of 60 pound." Well, it's like, how much power does your reel have? Your reel is only right. rated for 25 pounds of drag. So why do you have a 125 pound braid? You're just mm -hmm. taking away that sensitivity. Right, and I think I think there's there's a couple of things. You're not not only you're taking away the sensitivity, but you're also taking away that line cutting through the water. The thinner the line, the easier it's going to cut through the water. So when I fish really deep, and when I say really deep, I'm talking north of 700 feet of water on the bottom. I'm dropping down to 14 pound braid, right? Because wow. you want it. You want to be able to stay as vertical as possible in there. And something actually, it, it's funny. It's a video that I saw of you a while ago on I forget what it was on, but it was about techniques for for landing more grouper. Mm -hmm. And it was that initial, you know, five ten seconds. And it wasn't that you were, you know, ripping that rod up and really lifting and pumping. It was just getting those cranks on the fish, right? Mm -hmm. Same exact concept here. But the benefit that you have with slow pitches, usually those groupers are 
off the bottom already because they're coming at that jig. So you have a little bit of time. So even though the rod's not really used to fight the fish, you can put some heat on them with the rod, you know, leave it parallel to the water line, keep that thing up, but then you're just trying to get those cranks because it's, I think of it this way. We've got a uh, same exact reel right here. One crank of the handle is three feet, right? How far, if I, if I went from, the, from here to here, how far is that? That's yeah. about the same, right? So if I can get two cranks, that's twice as efficient as lifting and pumping on that fish. And you wind up landing more fish that way, I think. Um, it's particularly hard fighting bottom fish like grouper, amber, jack, those kind of things uh, when, you, when you use the right, the right techniques. So the trick is put cranks on the handle. That's the trick. Cranks on the handle, point and crank. That's what I tell people all the time. Don't lift and pump, point and crank. And that's that's true of typical bottom fishing too. So, so many times you'll have a, a, a guest out there catch a really big fish and their first instinct is to try to lift up and they're lifting, their, their veins popping out of their forehead and this fish is just dogging them to the bottom. Whereas you've got to turn that freaking handle. Turn the handle. That's the most important thing, no matter if you're slow pitch jigging or if you're bottom fish, uh, bottom fishing with bait. Uh, traditional fishing, if, if I will, <laughs> if I can. But, uh, yeah, I, mean, I can't emphasize that enough. Real, that's the biggest thing. Um, I think uh, Rich Golis, our uh, crew member who's now a captain on the Flying Hub too. Uh, I think he was out fishing with you guys, and you guys kind of got him hooked on slow pitch jig, and now he has a bunch of different slow pitch rods. And mm -hmm. uh, I laughed at him last time I went fishing with him because he brought out the little bass fishing reel, and I was like, what the heck are you doing with that thing? And he caught the biggest grouper on the trip that day. So, oh, yeah. uh, And that's the biggest mantra he always uses and is known for is he always screams, real, 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 and that's, that's important. Interesting. <laughs> Learn, learning something new. So that little baby, accurate, valiant, three thirty n. That's the three hundred n. Yeah. The what? So the biggest hands in the world, but you know, figure this is a, this is a kind of the small, medium, and large is, is what I use. So this is a three hundred. This is a five hundred narrow. So the narrow spools, and then when I go into the deep water, I'll break out the the six hundred and n. And this one holds about eleven hundred yards of that forty pound. So I should be good. Most ways. <laughs> 1100 yards wow that is a whole lot of line that's crazy yes yeah. so a question from one of our uh, viewers tonight is what length of rods do you recommend for slow pitch jigging style okay so if you are traditional pure slow pitch i like a rod that's about six foot eight or or like six eight to six ten the reason why is because that allows you for short technical movements more easily, um, but also allows you to kind of be a hybrid with that long fall movement, which I think is important to mix things up sometimes. Um, I found myself with the, that Innovate that I was speaking about earlier, which is an eight-foot rod. Um, I've been going to that the vast majority of the time now, and that's even with having access to everything else that's out there. I feel like the benefits of um, being able to fight the fish a little bit more with that rod uh, and being able to keep it away from a larger head boat is, is more beneficial. So if you're going to be fishing primarily from a larger head boat style, I would look for something that's one of those long fall rods that's like more towards eight feet. Whereas if you're primarily fishing off of a shorter private boat, you know, the six foot eight, six foot 10 rods are better. So you're saying an eight foot rod is what you prefer, specifically yeah. the Innovate series from Temple yep. Reef? Yeah. Temple Reef. Uh, because you want to be able to have a longer tip to keep that that line and that fish away from the boat, the bottom of the boat, and other anglers. Exactly right. Yeah, it's it's what I've noticed is it's made a huge difference with um, when fishing on those larger boats. Being able to keep it off of the keel of the boat, um, being able to keep the line away from the boat. Remember what I said before: braid breaks from abrasion. It doesn't break from um, you know from being. Uh, you know, straight pull. So when you're fishing on those larger boats and say something goes under the boat, it happens, you know, everybody knows that happens. Uh, you have a little bit more leeway, uh, a little bit more room for operator error, which is important. Yeah. 
Next question is, uh, how do you control your boat so the line stays vertical? Because this is one thing that I, I, again, I knew a little bit about this. And one of the biggest things I heard was you have to stay as vertical as possible to keep the action true and to get that jig working properly so you're catching fish. And I knew right. that was true of vertical jigs, even the old school approach of diamond jigs. You want to be as vertical as possible. So how do you control your boat so lines stay vertical while slow pitch jigging? Sure. So there's a couple of ways that you can do it. Um, well, let's say it's three ways, actually, that you can that you can do it. If you're fishing from a drifting boat, there's not too, too much that you can do other than cast up current in the direction that you're going. So as your boat is moving, you cast up this way. As your boat's moving, your line is coming down. So you're straight up and down when, you're, when you've met that point, okay? Another way to do it is if you have a drift sock. Um, the drift socks will slow down your drift quite a bit and you'll get, you know, more time on that spot. Uh, you know, part of the game though, just, it just is what it is, is you're going to be reeling up and down a lot. Okay. So just keep that in mind. It just is what it is. As you get scoped out, the jigs become less effective. We can talk about that if you'd like to go down that rabbit hole. But, um, for purposes of this question, the, the last the last thing that I would recommend, and this is something that we've been tinkering with recently, um, we've got access to uh, a Minn Kota Terra Nova trolling motor, an offshore trolling motor. And if you hit spot lock on that, you will stay in that exact same spot exactly where you're at. And it's magic. And I love it. And <laughs> I have unapologetically think it's really great. Um, as opposed to anchor fishing, which, you know, the boat is kind of swinging on that anchor and you, know, you still have to cast up current towards the bow because usually the current's running towards the stern. Um, I don't like fishing off of an actually anchored boat, if at all possible. I find that if you fish off an anchored boat, most of the time you're going to get hookups faster than everybody else. But if you don't get that initial quick hookup, it's going to be a long day for you. Um, it just it, it tends to not be as productive. A lot of times you have people that are not as friendly to jig fishing on the boat. You know, they're worried about their line is there where they'll start complaining about, oh, you're bouncing on the ground. So the snappers aren't going to bite, which objectively is BS. It <laughs> is. It's just that old school mentality that people have and they just don't want to kick it. So, yeah. um, you know, if you if you don't have to fish from a head boat on, on an anchor, then don't, you know, pick a different trip. So drift fishing is what you'd prefer or yeah. ultimately using a, a stupid spot lock GPS trolling motor. Yeah. Stupid spot lock is amazing, and everyone should definitely buy one for their boats if they like this. <laughs> because why? I mean, why? Why not stay directly over the place where all the fish live? I mean, that seems pretty intuitive, right? I mean, why yeah. wouldn't you? Why I mean, wouldn't yeah, you? if you like cheating, it, the spot lock GPS is awesome. <laughs> yeah, so just don't use bottom finders either. You know. <laughs> go out into the ocean and see what happens <laughs> <laughs> we were talking a few shows ago about how technology affects fishing and i think the worst thing for our offshore fishery was the spot lock gps and shout out to rodin for making it possible and it i'm i'm just teasing you benny it oh. is it is awesome uh, mm -hmm. basically for those of you watching who don't know what a spot lock gps a trolling motor is is a trolling motor you'd see it in three foot of water in tampa bay now they make 96 inch shaft trolling motors for the front of 36 foot yellow fins and mm -hmm. these dudes go ripping out there at 60 miles an hour put a trolling motor down in 200 foot of water and hit a button and it stops your boat and keeps your boat in that exact position so you're able to kind of dial in on a fishing spot with absolutely no grasp or technical skill of anchoring the boat or positioning the boat just hit a button. You see a good fish show, hit a button, and you're there. And uh, it definitely takes a lot of the guesswork out of positioning over the, fi the fish. Uh, and in the case of slow pitch jigging, that makes it real easy because you're able to stay on top of the fish and you don't have the boat swinging on the anchor. You don't have to com compete with the drift. Uh, so, yeah, I could definitely see it working really well if you're slow pitch jigging. I just, me personally... I have a thing about the spot lock GPS and all these new side scan 360 degrees sonars and all this fancy new technology is great. It makes it easy. It takes a lot of the guesswork out of our offshore fishery, but the easier you make it, the more people do it, 
the more that fishery declines and all of a sudden our regulations get more and more. People always ask why is snapper season getting so much shorter? Well, there's a lot that goes into it, but look at 20 years ago. I mean, my grandfather, for goodness sakes, 40 years ago, they were using soap on a rope to bot find bottom, uh, hard bottom. Whereas nowadays you've got, I mean, some of these new uh, bottom machines, you can see that ledge 30 feet out to the side of your boat. You don't even have to spot go over it anymore. It's crazy. I mean, some of them, some of them you can, the technology is great, but like you said before, you know, your grandfather is out there using whatever he's using to, to locate his coordinates. I know here where you can actually see shore, you know, and you're still in relatively deep water, people would triangulate positions, you know, but those are the same people that would tell you stories about how they pulled 15 gags off of this one spot. And guess what? There ain't no gags there anymore. Yeah. So no matter what kind of technology you have, you still got to be able to fish, right? That's true. So. Touche. Mm. <laughs> uh, we should drink some more rum and whiskey and talk more about that one <laughs> let's go <laughs> uh, let's see next question from a viewer is how much color does or how much does color matter on slow pitch jigs and how essential is it to have assist hooks on these are Sean these are great questions because this is what I wanted to know assist right. hooks top or bottom does it matter and then w color how much does it matter all right, so take those in reverse order. Color, I don't think necessarily matters as much as people think it does. Uh, I think that happens for a couple of reasons. The first reason is that the what we see up here is not what fish see down there, right? So Amen. you have, as you go down in the water column, the visible light spectrum changes dramatically as you go down. You know, first colors that go are red, last ones I think that you go are, are white, right? What I do think is important, though, is something that reflects ultraviolet light. Um, and this, this is very bro science, but um, when you shine an ultraviolet light on something and it either reflects like an orange, for instance, which obviously is not what most fish look like. They're not usually orange, but um, it'll reflect that light or something that has glow on it that reflects that UV light, um, particularly at the lower depths. Right. So if you think of it this way, just from like an evolutionary biology standpoint, these fish live in basically darkness. Right. But they still have eyes. So they have to be seeing something with those eyes. And it's not necessarily colors, but I find that if you're in 800 feet of water and something reflects UV light really well, fish will go after it, not necessarily just for the movement. Um, you know, that being said, colors that I like and tend to go to are either, um, you know, silvers, golds, uh, pinks, whites a lot. Um, I've had success in dark in deep water with black jigs, actually. Um, as you get shallower, uh, it, it's, you know, just reflective stuff, you know, things that are lights going to reflect off of it. But most of the, the, the important part is the action of the jig, right? Mm -hmm. How that jig performs in the water and how you're able to manipulate it in the water. And what was the, the second question was about assistance, right? Yeah. Yeah. Do you use them on the top or the bottom? I take option C, both. So I use assist hooks on the top and bottom because... So this is a rigged up jig. This is a Sea Falcon. Uh, this is a Z slow jig. But you'll see that my top ones are about a third of the jig. My bottom ones are about two thirds of the jig. But I have them on both sides. And you notice there's a couple of things. So these are Gamagatsu 510 assist hooks. These are 3 hooks, not particularly big hooks, not particularly big gauge hooks. You can see maybe if I get real close, yeah. the bar on the outside. You see that? Hmm. So so the barb being on the outside is functional. So you still have the barb, so it still holds in the fish's mouth. But if that jig hits your line, it'll slide off. That barb in the middle won't catch. So you have much fewer foul-ups on it. Wow. But because you're using low, you know, small hooks, low-gauge hooks, you need those hooks on the top and bottom because what will happen is usually fish hit from the front of something, right, because they want to inhale it and have everything pushed down so they don't get spikes in their face. So if this jig is swimming this way, the fish is going to attack from this side. If the jig is going this way, the fish is going to attack from this side, right? So that's mm -hmm. why you have both sides. Now, let's say the fish is hooked up. First thing he's going to do, shake his head. Well, where are these hooks going to go? Right into the side of his head, okay? So slow pitch jigging isn't necessarily the best for catch and release, but um, it's very effective in getting that fish securely snagged and dissipating the pressure from all those little hooks. Yeah. So not any one hook takes the brunt of you know a massive fish usually you you have at least two hooks in the fish 
Um, and that's why I fish top and bottom hooks. So you always have hooks on the top and bottom. Right. And the only variation that I have primarily is going to be if I'm fishing in very deep water, um, over 700 feet, I'll fish a single hook on the top and a single hook on the bottom as opposed to the dual assist hooks like you see here. And that's only to cut down on um, water? Uh, cut down found. on cut down drag. And also, um, really, the real reason for me is usually when you're fishing in that deep water, reeling up sucks. So I would much rather have something with a bigger mouth than like a, a black belly rose fish I or you. You know, something that's super small, something that's substantial that's going to hit like a, an 8 hook hook uh, that, that's going to take it. Okay. And so just devil's advocate here this isn't me asking this yeah. is me asking for the viewers <laughs> sure you show that jig again sure. how do you know what's top and bottom two of the eyes so that's purely uh, as simple as that you look at the eye of the jig yeah um there's some jigs so there's some jigs that are actually completely symmetrical um so this is a center weighted jig this is by a company called jig pro mm -hmm. and what they've done is on one side they've got the eye here on the other side they've got the eye here so it's now what do you do <laughs> put it on and go fish <laughs> so it doesn't matter which Whatever. side yeah i got gotcha. you so is that true of the other jig though with the eye on one side or do you always want to have it on that that side with the eye i, I always i always have well in terms of what side of you, you said tying the line to okay so the, yeah i'll always have the line on this side of it um okay. you know you can you can do whatever you want. You can you can vary it up. You can put your jig on like that if you want to and see what mm -hmm. happens. Uh, but most of these things are pretty well des pretty well designed and have had a, a good amount of R and D in them. So the shape that they are and where that eye is is really going to tell you what's the top and what's the bottom. Gotcha. And then as far as having the hooks one third for the top and two thirds for that bottom, is that just something you found you like, or is that? I common yeah I, I like having them set up like this the biggest thing about the hooks is that you don't want your hooks to meet in the middle okay so if you have top and bottom see how these will never touch in the middle reason why is you don't want them to foul up you don't want this hook to link up with this guy and now your jig is sideways in the water and you feel like you have a real small fish in you trip, yeah you rip up and you go uh, operator error you know so. so make sure they never touch and then one thing i learned about the the those assist hooks is what's why are you having them go like this instead of how most assist hooks are going to be your hooks are out and those those are designed to where your hooks come in like that right like, so why are they facing each other yeah what's that sure. called again happen is so like, like i said before so let's say it's going this way the fish is attacking from the front he hits this particular assist hook right this one here so that one's out still this is in the fish's mouth as he moves this one is going to come around like a snag from the other side and hit him in the other side of his face. Mm -hmm. So, you know, so it's really just securing it. So kind of think of it like that, you know, not necessarily like those Chinese finger cuffs, thing, but it's going to be both sides of his face and he's coming up. Like yeah, I gotcha. Yeah. And they're called scissor assist hooks, right? I I've never heard them called scissor assist hooks. I just I call them you. assist. Yeah. Okay. So uh, basically all the assist hooks now are going to be designed where the hooks are facing each other. Most of the yeah, most of the ones if, if it's for slow pitch, then yeah, they're gonna they're gonna face each other. I got gotcha. you. All right. Uh, next question. Let's see if we can find one. Some of these are for questions, just general Hubbard's Marina questions. And if you ask one of those, I'm gonna get to you guys. Don't worry. Uh, but it will probably be after the video. Um, all right. So another one of uh, your uh, fans, I guess you would say, uh, calling you Mr. Miyagi, thanking okay. you for getting him so addicted to slow pitch jig fishing. <laughs> oh, that is funny. Uh, so this one's interesting. So uh, this is one of our guests who fishes with us a lot. And he says, I've been very successful at slow pitch jigging on some of the boats that Benny fishes from, uh, like the ones out of Key West. 
but I haven't been able to duplicate that success on one of the 39 hour trips. Uh, that is my, and he's assuming that's because the boat down in Key West drifts, whereas we're going to be anchor fishing. And one of the things that I've always said about vertical jigging in general is I like to vertical jig again, those hammer diamond jigs. I would do it at the very beginning of a spot or the very end of a spot. And that's because the diamond jig is going to get to the bottom fast and I'm going to have the first shot at one of those big aggressive fish. And then mm. towards the end of a spot, those fish have been seeing nothing but bait, dead bait, live bait, and different variations. You drop down that big hammer diamond jig, and sometimes someone that might, or some of those fish that might have had fatigue are now all of a sudden excited about something looking a little different. Is mm-hmm. that something you would think would be successful, or what do you, what do you suggest it, to replicate exact, success? Exact, that is the exact same thing that I think. Oh, I right. think that, yeah, I think that in when you're fishing from an anchored boat, in my experience with it, I've had, I mean, I've caught really awesome fish off of an anchored boat, but almost every single time that I've caught that really awesome fish, it was the first or second drop on that spot where most people were jigging. Um, and it was, you were, you were new to that spot. Once you're there for a little bit and the boat has time to set up, it seems like the fish get a little bit more disinterested. Once you're about to go and those engines start up again, you know, kind of like that, the, you know, some of the fish are used to, you know, boats coming in there. It's that dinner bell. They hear the engine. Sometimes they'll smash that jig at the last part of it. But you'll have a real big lull in the middle a lot of times on an anchored boat, whereas the drift fishing is more of a slower, steady pick over time as you go over productive bottom. Interesting. Interesting. So as far as anchor fishing, when you're slow pitch jig fishing, you want to hit the very beginning and very end. Yeah. So that would be the same of old older school style mm-hmm. methods of jig fishing. Interesting. All right. Let's see what other questions do we have for you. If you ha- oh, this is a good question because I get this a lot in my office because we have some of those Daiwa SK jigs um, mm-hmm. because as slow pitch jigging became more and more popular, a lot of people came in the shop saying, "Hey, I want to try this. Do you have anything?" Well, I mean, I've talked to people at Sea Falcon, I've talked to other distributors, NLO jigs, uh, I've talked to a few j- slow pitch jig companies, but they sell a jig and then they sell assist hooks and then they sell split rings and then split ring pliers. And uh, I needed something to where a customer could come up to the wall and just pick something. So that SK jig was good in that respect because it was somewhat price acceptable and it was all kind of all in one. But a lot of people ask me is like, all right, so if i if I'm only going to buy one of these $30 jigs, which one should I buy? And my answer is just always get the biggest one because you want to stay as vertical as possible. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I don't know. What's what's the best answer? Uh, so if you had what, to take one jig. I have to pick one jig? One jig. What kind of a trip am I going on? You're going on a 39-hour fishing trip, fishing 120 to 250 foot of water. One jig. One jig. One jig, 150 is the deepest? Uh, 120 to 250. 100. Oh, sorry, 120 to 250. Uh, I'm going to go probably on eBay, and I'm going to buy 10-ounce gold hammered diamond jigs. That's what I'm going to buy. Again, <laughs> with the diamond jigs, the, the, the hammered diamond jigs. So what they makes work. that a slow-pitch jig? It's, it's how it's fished. It's not what the jig is. Right. So, so it's not it's not necessarily that the jig is a hammer diamond jig or that if you, you know, for instance, like a Williamson Benthos or, um, you know, other the other jigs that are that are commercially available, largely commercially available. It's how the jig is fished in the water. You're focusing on the fall. You're focusing on technical movements um, to get that jig to to go a certain way in the water, how it's designed to fall, really. And learning how everything falls in the bag is the biggest thing, in my opinion, that's going to separate a really good jig fisherman versus an average jig fisherman. But if you're talking about one thing that's going to cover the most bases, a center-weighted, hammered, 10-ounce diamond jig in those particular conditions is probably going to outperform or at least perform on par with everything else. Now, if you have someone like me that shows up with a bag of 50 jigs that knows how every one of them fishes, I'll probably do better than you. But... You got a damn good fighting shot with a gold hammer jig. So, how, 
<laughs> so I'm fishing a, a, a 10 ounce gold diamond hammer diamond jig a lot. I drop mm-hmm. it to the bottom. I, I work that rod up. I let that rod fall and I let the jig fall. The line goes tight. I jerk the rod back up. That's, that's me. That's jig fishing. Uh, yeah. So how do you then turn that into a slow pitch jig? And that's, you say it's how you fish it. So does, is that just mean changing the rod and changing the techniques? Yeah, it, it, it really it is. And, and really where the slow pitch jigging shines is having a system of gear that is angler friendly, right? Because when you're fishing that jig on whatever meat stick that you're fishing it on, right? And I've met you, you're a big dude, right? <laughs> but if, if you're a 60-year-old dude or 60-year-old lady that's going out there, you're not going to be taking your meat stick and going like this the whole damn day because it's tiring, right? Yeah. When I can a rod like you know and this is only the top portion of it right the innovate that we're talking about before this rod weighs six ounces with this reel the whole thing with line is less than a pound and a half wow okay a pound and a half you can fish that thing all day long and when you get hooked up with it it's gonna it's gonna absorb most of the of the violence of that strike so it's gonna be less taxing on you and you're just going to be able to reel it in nice and easy. So it's, you know, when you're doing, you know, when you say this, you know, this is kind of that northeast way where people are, you know, yeah. fishing for and whatnot. But it's a much more refined technique. You're doing a lot more of the, the work on it to get the fish to look at, look at the jig and say, all right, do you want in long fall? Do you want it in short little strokes? Do you want it just bounced off the bottom? How do the fish, or what are they keyed in on, Right. So it's not necessarily what you're presenting, it's how you're presenting it. And like I said, that hammer jig is a really good option for beginners to get a feel for what this is, right? You don't just get out of the, you know, turn 16 and get a Lamborghini and get on, you know, the highway and, and drive down the street, right? You know, or you have a GTS3 with you know, six speed. You don't do that. You get inside the beat up old car, you drive it for a while, you figure out how it works, and then you build your way up. Same thing with this, right? All right. All right, I get it. Kinda. <laughs> I, I mean, like... if you want, there I'll learn you something, but it'll be fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, all right, I gotta, I gotta get in the Honda first and drive that around before I get, get that. Back. Just get that meat stick out of your hand. <laughs> all right, so it's so you're saying I can slow pitch jig with my hammered diamond jig that I already have. It's nice and rusty because it's been in my family's tackle box for 30 years, 40 years. So that same jig can be used for slow pitch jigging, but you get rid of the rod and reel that, or the rod and reel that I'm using and you put it on a rod and reel like you're, you're talking about, one of those Innovate 8 foot uh, kind of hybrids or one of those 6 8 slow pitch rods. You put that jig on one of those rods with one of those accurate valiant 500 ends and now i'm slow pitch jigging sure are welcome so it has more to do with the rod and reel than it necessarily has to do with the jig uh more with a technique the technique and the technique is powered by the rod and the reel correct gotcha i think i'm starting to pick it up Mm-hmm. hopefully Sounds someone else is too <laughs> all right let's see what other questions do we have uh, I'm kind of getting uh selfish i want to go back to the questions i wrote for you uh what is the difference between a flutter jig and a slow pitch jig equipment the nomen- retrieve what just the just the nomenclature it's just what so when people say flutter jig they are talking about something that flutters on the fall, right? Now, I don't want to get too deep on the weeds there in terms of how things flutter, but the key to a good quality slow pitch jig is repeatable falling action, okay? You need to know how that jig is going to perform in in different conditions or in neutral conditions so that you can dial that into different conditions. So, for instance, this jig here, right? This is a seafloor control rector. This is, I, I put larger jigs so they came up better. So this is a 420 gram jig, okay? It's a very heavy jig. But this one, regardless of whether it's 100 grams or 400 grams, it's still gonna fall like this, 
in the water, okay? This jig here is 450 grams, so roughly the same weight as this one, but you can see, obviously, much different. This one's going to slide in the water like that, right? So you can use these different jigs, get different hydrodynamic properties to them, and learn how they're going to fall. So when people say flutter jig, they all flutter. But you want to have a jig that is going to have a repeatable falling action. So when you go out there, you're in 200 feet of water, you've got a knot of current, you go, all right, I want this jig as opposed to this jig because it's going to perform better in those conditions. How do you know what your jig is fluttering like or uh, how do you know what the yeah. repeatable action is? Two, two things are going to help you. The first is time on the water. The second is um, if you – there's two things that I'll do. There, the first is just hanging off the side of your boat, kind of lift it up and just let it fall and see what happens right there. You get a good idea. Do that about 10 times because, you know, it'll fluctuate in those 10 times, but you'll get a good idea of what's going to happen when that jig falls. If you're fortunate enough to have a deeper pool near you, um, you can get real crazy, go out to the pool and just actually see what happens in the water. when you But drop don't it let it hit the Mars site. <laughs> it may be a bad idea down there, but... You'll, you'll someone else's right. pool <laughs> right. so a public pool <laughs> um, and you'll have a good idea of what's happening with the jig but mostly time on the water yeah i don't know how many times i got screamed at as a kid because i that was one of the biggest tricks that i learned at a young age in shore fishing with different lures is learning how that lure works the pool is your best friend if you have a pool or you know someone it's better to know someone with a pool uh sure and try that jig in the pool and the, and the same must be true i was kind of wondering if you were going to say that uh about the slow pitch jigs and the flutter jigs so that's i think the biggest groundbreaking thing for me tonight is learning that you can slow pitch jig with virtually anything because mm -hmm. When someone came in my shop and asked me for a slow pitch jig, I went right to those Dio SKs and I said, oh, this is a diamond jig. That's not a slow pitch jig. And the, these are Williamson Benthos jigs. That's a knife jig. That's not a flutter jig or that's not a slow pitch jig or this is a flutter jig. It's not a slow pitch jig. So essentially all vertical jigs are slow pitch jigs if they're fished properly. Correct. Correct. Groundbreaking. All right. So let's see what other questions we have. We're getting really, really tight on time here. Uh, let's see if we can end it on a high note. I'm going back to my questions. <laughs> uh, so what's your favorite part about jig fishing? My favorite part about jig fishing has been the learning experience of it. Um, there is so much to learn and that's really the primary thing that, that got me involved with it is that I just, I love to learn. I love to figure things out and this thing, the rabbit hole is so deep and you can go as Sounds deep as like you it. want. It. Um, I've been very fortunate to have some really good experiences with it and, and become proficient at it early on. Um, hopefully been able to spread that a little bit with the folks that answer questions and stuff, but, um, for slow pitch. It's that a close second is is the strike. Yeah. When when you hook up with a fish, it is no mistake. You have, you know, some fish is trying to kill another fish with its face, and it is yeah. angry and violent, and it's it's it keeps you coming back every single time. It keeps and you back. I I definitely agree with that because I personally, again, going back to your uh, so eloquent description of me and myself and my meat sticks, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, even with that big old broomstick meat stick rod, I mean, most of the time I'm doing it for amberjack. So I'm, I've got a nine knot reel and a solid glass seven foot rod. I mean, the thing probably weighs six pounds and I'm working a 16 ounce, uh, hammered diamond jig. So it's, it's work, but man, when that, when you lower that rod tip and that 60 pound amberjack strikes, it is mind-boggling that rush that you get so i i can definitely feel it. and i couldn't imagine going from that solid glass seven foot rod and that big nine out reel to that little baby accurate valiant yeah. 300n and that little pinky uh rod blank i mean i couldn't imagine that that strike and how that would feel on that rod so i could i could see where your addiction becomes uh real yeah. now myself outsider looking in and seeing what slow pitch jigging slow pitch jig fishing did to 
Rich Golis, who was a solid Northeast New York bottom fisherman, uh, plenty of meat sticks in the closet and spinning rods and stuff like that. And now all of a sudden he's got five or six different slow pitch rods and he comes out with these rolls and he unrolls them of all these different slow pitch jigs. And I've seen the rabbit hole and well, how it swallows people up. <laughs> so my question to you is if I'm interested in, in dipping my toe in the slow pitch waters, but I don't want to jump to the Ferrari or if it's someone who's watching who doesn't have fifteen hundred dollars to throw down on one of these high-end combos how do you what is the honda accord of of slow pitch rods because it sounds like the 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 diamond jigs and the the flutter jigs and the knife jigs i have in my tackle box are going to work but i need a rod and a reel i guess to make the action and the technique happen so what is yeah. the honda accord all right, so in terms of rods, let's start with rods first. So in terms of rods, you're going to be looking, in my opinion, you're going to be looking somewhere between 250 and 350 for a rod. And, and the reason why I say that is, yes, there are lower priced options out there, but you have to be really wary right now because in recent years, last year and a half mostly, um, the slow pitch thing has become you know, kind of a buzzword. So what will happen is companies will rebrand or, or just like reconfigure existing models. So they'll have like a 12 to 25 inshore rod and they'll reconfigure the grips and the guides and all of a sudden it's a slow pitch rod. You know, and that's not really the case. Um, one of the other things too is that if you do buy this gear, most of the time the people then they buy it, they're going to go down the rabbit hole pretty good. They might not go as far as I have, but they're going to still go down it. But if they don't like it, right? If you buy a quality rod, you can at least resell it to someone for close to what you paid for it, right? Because if you buy a $350 rod and say, look, I used it a couple times, 300 bucks, most people will probably buy it. But if you buy that in, in, intro level rod and it's $100, $120, you're stuck with it. You've lost the money, right? Now, in terms of reels, you can go into you know the Acura, the Valiant 500 ends. Those are you know 500 bucks for those reels. But if you have a reel that has between 38 and 46 inches of retrieve, puts out, you know, 20, 25 pounds of smooth drag, throw some 30 pound line on it, you know, use what you have if you have something around that's available. Start with that first and then figure out, oh, okay, this is what I need to do to go to the next level. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I hate to use the term cheap out, but, you know, cheap out on the rod. Um, the reel is very important. Everything is very important as a system, but for, you probably can get out the gate for if you buy the rod 350, you already have the reel, then you're fine. You buy both, you're looking at 600 bucks probably for a setup. All right. So you could get away with using something that you already have, like a, a basically a, as far as the rod, you want to get a nice rod, but as far as a reel, you could get away with something you already have. Basically, we're talking about a high speed gear ratio real something yeah. in the four to one five to one six to one gear ratio yeah usually what i find is rod, reels that are in like that six to one ratio but but again it, it really depends on the particular reel that you're using for instance if you have a reel that's a, a larger diameter reel you can have a lower ratio but more retrieve on the line so you're looking for like i said that 38 to 46 inches of retrieve on mm -hmm. the reel is kind of like the ideal i've never heard that as a rule i've always heard of gear ratios i've never heard of retrieve in inches as a as a rating to a reel yeah. is that and the listed reason on reels? Why, the reason why it's important is is really because you, you actually mentioned it yourself you want to stay as vertical as possible so once that jig hits there's going to be some scope in your line a little bit having a fairly fast retrieve that 38 to 46 inches or so you're going to get that slack out really quickly it's hmm. not necessarily what the the reel is because for instance this one is a six to one this one's a six to one this one's a six to one. They're all different, right? This one's going to have a significantly higher retrieve than this one just because of the physics of, or the math really, yeah. of having a smaller diameter spool, mm -hmm. right? So I've had very tall reels that have a lower gear ratio, but actually more retrieve than my smaller reels that have a higher gear ratio, but are having roughly the same retrieve rate. So for those of you watching, you're talking about a four out reel. Most of us have those four out reels like the mm -hmm. Daiwa uh, uh, LD50. So it's like a four-out size reel. Uh, so that in a six-to-one is going to be plenty good 
for your intro level slow pitch jig fishing. Yeah, yeah, something like that. All right. We gotta dumb it down, man. <laughs> All right, because I'm 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 right with the anybody watching. I'm uh, learning myself for sure because uh, that's interesting. I've wanted to try it, but that's uh, the the barrier to entry on slow pitch jigging seems a little high when you start looking at the price of the jigs and the prices of the rods and all that kind of stuff. So it'd be uh, scary, you know. Goggle eyes are expensive too. Yeah, you know? I, I don't know, man. I, I already I already have my bait fishing rods and I really enjoy spending money on stuff like guns and other things that I don't want to go down the route rabbit <laughs> hole on uh, slow pitch jigging and then all of a sudden I'm sacrificing my budget on other things you know yeah. but uh, I don't know after the after tonight's show I might I might have to dabble in it <laughs> maybe try it out you might like it yeah yeah those innovate rods is that something you get through Temple Reef? Uh, yeah, there's uh, there's a couple of stores here on – there's no stores actually in the West Coast that carry them right now. Um, there's a bunch of stores on the East Coast of Florida that have them uh, going kind of north to south. We've got Strike Zone in Melbourne, uh, Chaos in Lighthouse Point, uh, Big Dog Tackle in Pompano, Real Deal Bait and Tackle in Fort Lauderdale, Captain Harry's in Miami. All of them have them. Um, or you can you know they can reach out to me. I can put you in touch with the right people. I think someone just set off some Tannerite or something in my neighborhood. Holy moly, that was a big bump. Uh-oh. Yeah, man. The 4th of July fireworks are real. Yeah, um, they were pretty out there this weekend. It was nuts, man. Last night was crazy. Yeah, my poor dog. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my dog, my Doberman. I have a 90-pound Doberman. Huge, scary-looking dog. But he's scared of his own shadow. If you walk <laughs> out with a hair dryer or a power drill or anything in your hand, he freaks out. But fireworks, he's totally chill with. Blows my mind. It doesn't make any sense. But uh, I think we are pretty much out of time. We're over time. And I appreciate you spending tonight with us. That was uh, definitely uh, very innovative to me. I learned a lot tonight. And uh, I'm excited to get out there and try it. And uh, might have to... uh, steal one of rich's rods next time i go fishing and uh try it that way that'll be even easier right <laughs> yeah give it a try if a buddy is willing to let you uh borrow one by all means do it <laughs> take advantage of it and look it's it's fun it's another tool in the bag you know it's you know some people like me will go down and it's i don't even fish bait anymore i, I i'll go on multi-day trips i won't even bring a bait rod with me uh just because that's my thing you know i like doing it but for most people it's just something awesome to have out there. Even a lot of tournament fishermen now, you know, when something, you know, you have that, that lull in the bite, people are out there jig fishing for in tournaments and it's, it's pretty, pretty productive. Cool. Well, I appreciate it. We got to give the people what they want. They're interested in their free trip giveaways. So you're welcome to hang around and see who wins or uh, I'll catch up with you later because uh, we got to do this right. again in the future because I feel like we got kind of got class 101 done, but 102 is coming in the future. <laughs> 102 probably should come in the future. So I'm actually packing for a multi-day right now. So I will see you guys later. Thank you very much for having me. I hey, appreciate man, I, it. I really appreciate you coming. Thanks. All right. Have a good night. See ya. All right. So with that, we are going to do the giveaways. I apologize for running overtime tonight, uh, but I was I was learning a lot with you guys. I was right there with you, and uh, that was interesting. That was interesting. Definitely a different take on our show. Most of the time, it's just me or me and one of the crew or one of the captains uh, shooting the breeze and talking about what we do here at Hubbard's Marina. Tonight was a little different, and... I'm going to try to shake things up in the coming weeks, hopefully have some different guests on the show and do different things like this every now and again, not every week, but every now and again, I want to keep it fresh because uh, I want to learn more about our fisheries and all the different dynamics and different techniques because that's the beauty of our fisheries. You can do things so differently and catch really big fish. Uh, If you enjoyed tonight, Hopefully, uh, you can check out Benny Ortiz. He's got his Facebook, Instagram. On Instagram, it's Mr. Benny Ortiz. On Facebook, it's just simply Benny Ortiz. And uh, he does a bunch of seminars in Southeast Florida. He's been doing some virtual seminars, and uh, that's what made me hit him up. But let's get these live uh, or these free trip giveaways done because we've been a little neglectful. 
tonight. So I'm going to pull up here who is the lucky winner of a 10 hour all day for two. And then we're going to give away that 39 hour fishing trip for one. So 10 hour all day trip for two guests coming at you. Let's see who the lucky winner is on that 10 hour all day trip for two guests. 10 hour all day for two. Lucky winner is Jonathan E. Shelby. Jonathan Shelby, make sure you text us at that phone number in the upper right hand corner of the screen to claim that free trip. All right, so now we gotta give away that 39 hour trip, but before we do that, Please, if you're watching on YouTube, don't forget to subscribe to our page. If you're watching on Facebook, don't forget to like our page. Uh, hopefully, we'll see you again next week for another episode of that live stream show. This is every Sunday night, guys, 8.30 p.m. We're right here, same place, same bad channel. Hopefully, you can join us again next week. And with that, let's give away that 39-hour fishing trip for one guest 39 hour fishing trip for one guest. That lucky winner is Jeffrey Ochoa. Legend said Benny was once a bottom bait fisherman. That's what I heard too. I think that legend is real. <laughs> but thanks for tuning in tonight, guys. If you asked a question about something that was not slow pitch jig related uh, via text message in that upper right hand corner, text in that number. I'm going to go back through and try to answer your questions now after the show has ended. I appreciate everybody hanging out with us tonight and joining us for this special episode of the live stream show. We'll see you again next week for another episode. Thanks for hanging out with us and joining us. Y'all have a good night.